Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining our breakout session, Building Stronger Workplaces Through Allyship. My name is Megan Spate, and while my official title reads Public Relations Coordinator, I'm here representing my additional title as Head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at PMI. I'm thrilled to share this space with Brantley Underhill, Project Management Institute's Managing Director of North America, as well as Jesse Romanelli, Technology Project Manager at New York Life as we discuss how individuals and organizations can step up to build stronger relationships and create more inclusive and inviting workplaces for all. I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge in this conversation that we're in the midst of a crisis. Millions of women are leaving the workforce. Here in the US alone, female workforce participation has dropped nearly 57% the lowest since 1988, according to the National Women's Law Center. Recent projections based on economic scenarios from McKinsey and Oxford Economics estimate that employment for women may not even recover to pre-pandemic levels until 2024. That's two full years after a recovery for men. A clear and present inequity that can be solved through additional and continued employer support as well as upskilling and pay equity. With that being said, let's get started. So Brantley, can you share what does gender mean to you? Thanks, Megan, it's my pleasure to be here. To me, gender means how one identifies themselves. Brantley, thank you so much for sharing your definition on what gender means to you. Jesse, can you also give us some insight? What does gender mean to you? Sure, thank you, Megan. So gender to me is a social construct. It's a way that we categorize both feminine and masculine traits. How we I identify helps us to communicate to others how we connect internally with, with those traits. In our interactions, uh, we use gender to relate to one another as well as to understand our shared experiences. It helps us helps bring us closer together at times. Gender ultimately is a spectrum and there are an infinite number of possibilities between what we consider traditional man and woman. So, thank you, Jesse, for that, sharing that. Will you um, continue to share what your experiences have been like in your career identifying how you do? Yeah, well, I've often been mistaken for being a man because of my name. I will, would have spent years emailing and corresponding with somebody prior to social media days where we would eventually meet in person. And when I would extend my hand and introduce myself, uh, they would get taken aback and go, oh, I thought you were a man. <laughs> and it was always a, an interesting first uh, introduction. And that's happened to me more than a dozen times. Wow. Uh, it's it fun in the moment, but uh, it, there are times when it's important for me to declare uh, that I am Mrs. Brantley Underhill, and uh, when I'm traveling and being in different places around the globe, uh, it's important sometimes to be clear or help your host know uh, how you identify. Uh, I'll speak from experience being in a Muslim country where as soon as you enter the airport, uh, women walk through one aisle and men through another and even down to how you transport yourself and uh, where your accommodations are so it, it's important uh, to be able to be clear about that as you move around the world so yeah I, I certainly understand that you always want to be aware and mindful of those things Brantley thank you so much for sharing your story Jesse, would you also mind sharing what your experience has been like in your career identifying how you do? Yes, absolutely. So I was assigned female at birth. You know, I, I began in my career identifying as a woman. You know, I, I transitioned several years ago. Um, and now, you know, in, in the IT world, which is quite binary, I'm often dis I'm often perceived as a man until I disclose you know, the fluidity of my gender identity. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, many, many different experiences, you know, before transitioning when, you know, identifying as a woman as, as compared with now, you know, being perceived as a man. 
Um, but moving to a different subject, we in the workplace, we have experienced that there are allies who act as sponsors, mentors, or even just a listening ear. Can you share an experience where an ally was truly there for you in the workplace? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can think of many times when they weren't. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's stories for another time. Uh, I think uh, I often come back to where I admire uh, the qualities of others and what they bring to the table in a team, because every person is coming there with some specialty. And where I find myself coming up short or wanting to learn a little bit more, I'm very curious. I'm curious about people and their stories and where they come from, how they grew up, how they learn what they learn and uh, spend some time with them. Ask them if they're willing to spend time with me on a regular basis to brainstorm, to innovate, ideate, uh, think of ways that I can get some of this skill, transfer some of this knowledge, and uh, listen and, and observe, and hopefully be able to offer that in return. So I'm uh, always looking for those types of opportunities and have those relationships going uh, at many times. Yeah, I certainly agree with you. I, I know myself, I've experienced a few allies in the workplace and it definitely makes a difference, uh, not just in the workplace, but even outside of work. It, it truly, truly makes a difference. So thank you for sharing your experience. Jesse, could you also please share, you know, we know that those allies, sponsors, mentors, you know, they, they mean a lot to us. Can you share what your experience has been like where an ally was truly there for you in the workplace? Absolutely. Uh, so when I began my current role, um, I the first person that I disclosed to was was my manager. Mm -hmm. She's one of the few women in the department, so she was kind enough to share some of her experiences and observations uh, relating to, to tol the tolerance of, of other you know colleagues in our department, so that I was able to to better navigate you know my journey. Um, better navigate how to proceed with, you know, potentially disclosing to others and make truly informed decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if she hadn't shared, you know, I, I wouldn't have had that background. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, I know how important having someone there for you truly is. Um, and I can only imagine how important, you know, her participation and support during your transition and really into this new phase of your life has been for you. So thank you. Jesse, a few questions for you specifically. First one, what advice would you give someone who has recently learned that someone on their team uses pronouns different from what they assumed? How can they ensure that their own internal bias doesn't impact those working relationships? Yeah, so I would say first and foremost, the most important thing to remember is that this is still the same person. They still have the same professional experience. Um, you know, if you're viewing that person differently, I would suggest asking yourself why. You know, yeah. what what does this tell you about you know how you view gender? Mm -hmm. This person has has the courage to to really outline a way by which you can show them respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? You may misspeak and that's okay. Um, you know, it, it requires patience. Um, and it's okay to, to correct yourself and apologize if you do. Mm -hmm. You know, every person's experiences are, are going to be different. You know, everyone feels comfortable with different things. So it's really important to communicate with this colleague, preferably one on one and not, not in a group setting. Yeah. And be sure that, you know, this conversation, this communication, is relegated to, to ways by which you can support them and not expect that person to educate you unless you know they express that they're comfortable with such. You provided some really great tips. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, in addition to those tips, another question for you. What words of encouragement would you share with someone who is contemplating sharing their gender identity with their colleagues? You spoke earlier about your manager who was truly there for you during that time. How can others, you know, work towards doing what you did in their own way? If they choose to do so, I should say. Sure, yes. So I would say, most importantly, you deserve to be respected. Mm -hmm. You deserve to bring your whole self to work authenticity yields better results not only for your personal work but it also helps to shape your your organization's culture mm -hmm. 
This takes a lot of courage though. So just remember to be kind to yourself, you know, yep. have appropriate support in place, you know, whatever that looks like for you, you know, and, and be patient. Don't feel pressured. You know, if, if you're not ready to disclose, that's okay. Yeah. And it's also okay to take, you know, a, a phased approach like I did. Um, if you have a couple of trusted colleagues, you know, where you can rely on their confidentiality, mm -hmm. that could be helpful for you. So we give so much of ourselves to our work and no one <laughs> deserves to endure intolerance. Yeah. So having a network of supportive colleagues is, is really very important. And being part of an organization that supports diversity, equity, and, court, and inclusion really helps everyone to flourish. Yeah. You, you said a lot of really great points there, and I think the one thing that I want to drive home is be kind to yourself. There's so many people out there who unfortunately aren't kind to people. And I think that if internally we can, you know, give ourselves a break every now and then and truly be kind to ourselves, we can then become stronger in, situ in those unfortunate situations. But hopefully as we continue to do this work, we will have fewer and fewer of them. So thank you for sharing your story, Jesse, and those in words of encouragement. Brantley, so in regards to a different type of experience um, that you did kind of touch on in your previous response, but could you share a time where you felt that you may have been treated differently or maybe felt at a disadvantage and it was called out or made very clear that it was because you are a woman? Yeah, so this story is it's my personal experience so uh, there was a time when i was working in an all-male unit male boss some of all my uh, colleagues and the leadership team were male and I, I don't think that was really called out all that much but i would notice that i would be the last one to get information with news updates uh, in the group, I noticed that I wasn't invited to impromptu celebrations or happy hours. Uh, I noticed that I would get assigned tasks or projects that had a 48 hour turnaround time when I knew that my boss had received it weeks in advance. Uh, it was I'm not sure it was intentional. Uh, my colleagues noticed uh, the disadvantage I was being put into and but nobody has said anything. Uh, I think making sure that everyone on the team has equal access to knowledge and fairness in the way that they're provided assignments and support makes all a difference. And I'm not always sure that that was really the intention, but you know, when you're the only female in the group and there's something different, there's something different. <laughs> No, you're you're very, very right in stating that. Um, I've heard experiences from my mom and other women of how they've been treated differently, and it was clearly because they're a woman. Um, she probably wouldn't be happy with me sharing this, but an experience that I've heard was when, you know, there is a group of men and one or two women, and my mom was left out and not having a chair brought over to the table for her. Um, and her having to physically make space at the table for herself. Um, so it it truly happens and it's 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 quite frustrating, but hopefully we can look to the future to make those changes. Mm -hmm. um, I know that it's water under the bridge for your um, situation. However, could you share how it really could have been handled differently? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, sharing information equally. So when we need the team to be working together towards a common goal, everyone's getting access to the same resource, the same information in a timely manner. Uh, when you're a leader, people are watching. Uh, they're observing, uh, they're mimicking, and it's, it's crucial that your job is to help the team be successful or serving in that role. Um, so why wouldn't you want everyone to have equal access to information and support? You're very, very right there. Um, I know that for the team that I'm on, the communications team, our VP is very intentional about sharing that he moves and acts accordingly and with equity. And I know that our team is truly grateful to have him. So to have a leader to look up to that really models that as someone who is coming up in her career, it truly makes a difference. And 
looking to the future, it shows me who I need to model my own leadership skills after. So I truly commend you for being that example for your team as well. Thank you. Yeah, so at PMI, um, we do stand by the fact that projects have the power to make a better world. And the project economy is the best way to move organizations and the world forward. As I mentioned earlier, women are facing a crisis and many are either forced due to no other option or are making that decision on their own to lead the workforce and care for their family. From your perspective, what steps can organizations take to turn this around? First and foremost, put your people first. When the pandemic started, leaders on my team immediately focused on the work from home dynamics that were impacting our staff. You know, uh, groups of people, you know, living in a home from, you know, infants to multi-generational households to homeschooling kids to remote care for family members in other states. Uh, this this was important to have the conversation about what it was, what was going on and what it was looking like as we all learned to settle and adapt to it. It also set boundaries and expectations. Like we got things to take care of, family, home, self-care first. Then we manage the workload. And then we, we talk every week. How's it going? What's working? What's not? Um, how is everybody doing? Yeah. Um, you know, regarding the boundaries, uh, it's that we have so few boundaries <laughs> right now, it seems, yeah. in the workplace and at home, a family, school. Uh, and it's forced women to make this all or nothing decision. Either I work this job with rigid expectations or I go care for my kids and my parents. Um, what if we offered reduced work hours or altered schedules or part-time project work at full pay? Yeah. Um, Another thing uh, to consider is how we help employees rest, relax, rejuvenate. I know there's a space on my calendar every Monday that gives uh, us the time to do that. Sometimes that's just the buffer <laughs> between all those meetings we're running to yeah. at home. Uh, and lastly, I would say just ask. Ask your people. Ask your employees. You know, what do they want? What do they need? Uh, create the space to have those conversations and keep tracking it, keep an eye on how everyone is doing. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Brantley. I remember um, when I was in a different role on another team, my manager at the time gave me a lot of grace. Uh, well, I personally do not have a direct family in my own home that I care for. I do have family members that I do help support um, throughout all the time, but especially throughout the pandemic. And there was a moment when um, I needed to take my aunt to the grocery store. She is um, above the age of, above a certain age, we'll just say. And um, I wanted to ensure that she got there safely and got home safely. And my manager at the time allowed me to, you know, step away from my desk in the middle of the day, which typically is unheard of, <laughs> and to, you know, make sure she got to the grocery store and got back safely. And then I came back and got, you know, right back to work. But, you know, I just I think of a few years ago where asking for something like that and maybe not asking, but, you know, even thinking that, oh, I could step away from my desk to just take care of something quickly. You know, it, it's almost unheard of in some organizations. So I, I certainly agree with, you know, having different boundaries and asking for things. Um, it, it certainly makes a difference. So thank you for sharing that. So to both Brantley and Jesse, I'd like to ask, you know, as we work towards an equitable future, what does gender allyship in the workplace look like and mean to you? So allyship to me, um, I, I would say the most important piece is each team member looking inside themselves, mm. right? Each person has different, different experiences that makes them unique. If we can really see and embrace our own individuality and our own differences, we become much more receptive and accepting of the differences of others. Yeah. You know, our, our diverse perspective and our, our unique experiences are what foster innovation for our organizations. If we allow these differences to inspire us and for our shared humanity and not our commonalities to connect us, we become a much stronger team. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Jesse. You know, we 
we work better when we come together to work towards a common goal. We're more efficient. We are provided really, quite frankly, a stronger outcome of the work that we're doing. So thank you for sharing that response today. Brantley, so as we work towards an equitable future, what does gender allyship in the workplace look like and mean to you? Mm -hmm. uh, it means one of the things it means is asking for help. Uh, I recently read or listened to the book Bravey by Olympic distance runner Alexi Pappas, where she said that asking for help is a superpower that everybody has, but only some people use. Yeah. Think about that. Oh, yeah. I found that quite profound uh, that asking for help creates an environment to have the conversation, uh, to support one another. I, Look at what we've gone through. <laughs> I think the only way that we're pulling out of it is if we work together and ask for help and support one another. Yeah. Uh, so ask for help. Yeah, you're very right. I am one of those people who has struggled with asking for help, but over the years has gotten at least a little bit better at it. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Brantley. Thank you, Jesse, your time today, and more importantly, Thank you for sharing your stories. Today we've touched on how individuals have and can be impacted in the workplace, as well as solutions for making changes. As a woman, I personally aim to work towards a more equitable workplace by speaking up for myself and others when necessary and being aware and mindful of my own language use and behavior. I believe that this must start in our personal lives because by making the choice to have an open mind to listen to others and to internally become more aware of how we treat each other. This state of mind intentionally practiced at home will then make its way to the workplace where we all reap the benefits of this inclusive culture in the present as well as in the future. Thank you to all who have joined us for this engaging conversation. We look forward to welcoming questions and additional discussion in the PMI Empowerment Studio. Have a great day.